This is part four of our lecture on oceans. In this part, we're going to cover ocean carbon interactions and how the ocean is sort of a big player in um, what we can expect from climate change. So we were talking about how water is weird and how it has this very high specific heat capacity. So that is going to have a strong interaction with what we are expecting for climate change, both for carbon storage as well as for energy storage for heat. Whenever we're talking about climate, lately, we're talking about carbon. So oceans are a carbon sink. That means that they absorb and store a lot of carbon. So they absorb about a quarter to a third of the CO2 that we emit every year. <laughs> Oceans are also a carbon sink, literally. Um, so a big part of that CO2 absorption is by photosynthesizers. So our phytoplankton are taking in CO2 um, and building it into molecules, making tissues. Um, I keep saying that, making tissues, uh, but they're probably unicellular organisms that don't have tissues, so they'll turn into somebody else's tissues. So CO2 comes out of the air, um, into the water, and then becomes part of organisms. So that's a big part of CO2 absorption. But also, that CO2 can just be dissolved in the ocean water in those surface layers. So the CO2 that gets incorporated into organisms, that is going to physically sink as those organisms die. Um, another thing that is going to be sinking is their poop, right? So they're going to be um, eating and expelling and um, those fecal pellets are going to also fall down to the bottom of the ocean. So that combination of dying um, phytoplankton and zooplankton as well as all that poop is um, a bunch of nutrient rich material that's called beautifully marine snow. So all of that carbon rich material is falling down to the bottom of the ocean for long term carbon storage. So that carbon can stay in those living organisms, it can go to the bottom as dead organisms or as poop, or another way that carbon goes into those organisms, not just photosynthesis, is through making exoskeletons. So a lot of sea life, um, marine life, is making an exoskeleton out of calcium carbonate. And so there's that carbon part of it. So they take CO2 to you make that calcium carbonate exoskeleton. And that is also gonna to fall to the bottom with them when they die. So that carbon is buried in ocean sediments and it's stored for centuries, millennia, for so long. And so that pumping of carbon from the atmosphere into organisms down to the bottom of the ocean is called the biological pump because it's happening through these living beings, pumping it down to the bottom of the ocean for long-term carbon storage. So the biological pump, microorganisms act to pump CO2 from the atmosphere into ocean sediments. You should know this term because it's hugely important to how the ocean helps us um, mitigate climate. This is a picture of it happening. We have CO2 that's being released from our system here. So that atmospheric CO2 sometimes gets returned to the atmosphere. When the ocean warms, it can store less because the water molecules are moving around more, so more of the CO2 can escape. However, a lot of it is going to go into phytoplankton. Um, those are going to get eaten by zooplankton. Those are going to form an aggregate that's going to sink. Um, we might have some that just die and sink. Some of them are gonna dissolve into pieces and sink. Um, we have zooplankton that can move between different layers of the ocean. Um, there's gonna be CO2 that gets released from those, um, but a lot of it is gonna be moving down here to the bottom, whether that be as dead organisms or as poop. So what happens to the water when atmospheric CO2 dissolves in the ocean? We can remember that CO2 plus H2O is a weak acid, right? Carbonic acid. So if we are adding atmospheric CO2 to our ocean water, that surface layer is going to get more acidic, but that CO2 will get rapidly taken back out by the phytoplankton. However, there are limits to everything. So as you add more atmospheric CO2 
to our global system, which you can follow here. You can look at our seawater, and the seawater CO2 is here. So that's a concentration of CO2 dissolved in seawater. So it increases at the same rate as our atmospheric CO2 increases. And then down here, we can look at the trend of the ocean pH. And it's not a huge change, but any small change to the ocean, because the ocean is so large, actually takes a lot of input. Um, and because the ocean is so large and changes so slowly, often the organisms in the ocean um, are drastically affected even by small changes because they're not used to those huge fluctuations like we are out here as land dwellers. So we can see as we add CO2 to our ocean water, the pH drops. It becomes more acidic, and that's because we're forming that carbonic acid. Here is an infographic that I picked because it's kind of like extreme um, and they've made some very extreme color choices. So here is a green shell, which would not normally be green. There's nothing about it that would normally make it green. And then here we have these fire arrows bringing CO2 down into the ocean, making the ocean fiery, right, to, to tell us that it has heat, right? CO2 is somehow related to heat maybe is what they're trying to tell us with these colors. And then we see our seashell goes from green to oh, sickly yellow and we see this deterioration here and then it turns into molten lava. Um, so this is a little bit of a dramatic um, infographic which isn't bad, right? Um, you are trying to communicate information to people and some people are going to understand this better than they're going to understand something that maybe looks um, more cute and more sciencey, right? Sciencey, like that's a thing. So we're conveying this idea that as you add CO2 to the atmosphere, much of that CO2 goes into the ocean and it acidifies the ocean. And the big point is that that is going to change the way that seashells form. So we're no longer going to be able to form our calcium carbonate if we have too much CO2. And that is going to cause our seashells um, to be malformed as well as to, to degrade because calcium carbonate is um, a basic compound. So if you put a basic compound in an acidic solution, it's gonna start to break down because that's what acids and bases do is they neutralize each other. So um, the big point here is that ocean acidification, this increase in CO2 is going to um, make it so any marine life that relies on calcium carbonate for an exoskeleton isn't going to be able to do that anymore. So this is that same idea communicated in a different way. So this one is the more cutesy sciencey one I was thinking of. Um, so we have kind of our story up here and then we have um, pictures that show okay we have CO2 Here's how it gets added from particulates that are raining down into the ocean, as well as somehow in runoff, um, which is going to be more of different types of pollution um, is how they get in here. So there's a lot of miscommunication with infographics, which is interesting. Um, but this will all bring important changes to the pH anyway. Um, so same idea, but conveyed in a totally different way. So just be thinking about what are the different ways we can communicate scientific information and what's effective, what's not effective, um, what do you like in a communication form? Um, is some font too small? Is there too much there? Are people not going to read it? Should you try to make it shorter? Um, you can use familiar things like kryptonite, tug of war, and boxing match to um, try to take maybe complex ideas and make them more familiar. So just a few examples of different infographics as we're thinking about how we're going to do that for our particular research topics.